a reasonable place to start if you're thinking about making that commitment is to go back and sit down with your agent or go on Zillow or Redfin or um, whatever you need and start looking at the properties that have sold in the last 90 days, 90 or 180 days. Um, I usually say 180, but this year it's bad. I've had to go to 90 because the market changes so quickly with this. Um, okay, so in the last 90 days, let's say that there has been five properties that have sold that meet your qualifications, that are in your price range with that and that meet, meet this criteria you've scoped out. You know at that point that a property on average is gonna sell that meets your criteria every two and a half weeks. So that's a pro appropriate goal. You know that you probably have a good shot at buying a property that's gonna meet your criteria in the next 90 days because you're gonna have five chances on average with that. That's a, that's probably, and, and you know that that's a good deal because you've narrowed it down until you found the five best deals that have actually transacted in a recent past in your market with that. So that, that's a potential place to start, I think. Scott, thank you for joining me on our Thought Leader Spotlight Series. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Camp, head of partnerships for Deal Machine. And on these, we really like to shine a spotlight on industry experts like yourself and hear your inspiring stories and get your thoughts on, you know, where the real estate world is evolving to. So uh, today, really excited to welcome on Scott Trench. Uh, you're the CEO of Bigger Pockets, the world's largest online network for or of real estate investors. Um, I know personally, uh, Bigger Pockets, amazing community, fan, you know, phenomenal content. Um, you've got a suite of tools to help you really kind of build wealth and then achieve uh, financial freedom through real estate investing. And outside of all that, you personally are a speaker, um, you know, co-host of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, uh, multiple-time author, including best-selling book Set for Life, and uh, a real estate investor yourself. So, uh, welcome on, Scott. Yeah, thank you. That was a, a, wonder, a very nice introduction. So I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and, and really excited to dig in here. I mean, I think um, it's something that even in my own, you know, personal uh, journey, just around real estate in general, um, I spent many hours, you know, listening to your guys content, listening to Brandon or David on their podcasts. Um, I think a lot of uh, you know, what, what helped me be prepared to step in a deal machine uh, was the knowledge that I got through, through you guys as well. So uh, definitely uh, was excited to have you on. Wanted to say thank you for, for you know, running such a great organization. And, um, you know, to start off, like, uh, I've read a little bit about that, you know, about you and that bio, but would love to hear more about your journey to where you are now at Bigger Pockets and, and, and uh, you know, hear, hear about your personal uh, journey to begin with. Yeah, happy to, happy to talk about that. So I graduated college in 2013, and I started my first job in later that year in August 2013. And within three months, uh, I was a financial analyst at a Fortune 500 company. Within three months, I kind of decided I'd like to become financially free and retire very early, um, rather than kind of do the traditional career route. So I started following two blogs or two resources. One was Mr. Money Mustache, which is a personal finance blogger um, that talks about early retirement. And the second is Bigger Pockets, which is obviously um, a real estate investing um, hub and community and educational resource. And so I, uh, I began saving up as much as I possibly could with the intent to house hack, um, probably starting end of 2013, going into 2014 with that. And by the middle of 2014, I had saved up about $20,000 and was actively looking for both my first house hack and a new job opportunity that would give me more upside potential than the kind of step-by-step -step path that was offered to me at the Fortune 500 company. And so I take Josh Dorkin and Brandon Turner's podcast advice and start networking with local real estate investors. And through that, I join a mastermind group. I take one of the guys from the mastermind group out to lunch just to get to know him and his backstory. And he happens to work in the same co-working space as the founder of Bigger Pockets, Josh Dorkin. So I'm like, oh my gosh, Josh, you changed my life. I'm doing all this kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm literally right now networking with somebody like you told me, uh, <laughs> taking him to lunch with all that kind of, you know, he tells me, go away, kid, uh, a few times. He's probably more polite than that, but that's how, that's how, that's how it appeared to be, uh, something, something to that effect. So I followed up with him six more times, of course, and eventually he offered me a interview and a job opportunity at Bigger Pockets as the director of operations. So I was the third employee at Bigger Pockets. Bigger Pockets at that point had been around for 10 years. I think it was 2014 and it started in 2004. Um, so I, I was the third employee after 10 years. Josh had been painstakingly building this awesome community, uh, brick by brick forum, podcast, YouTube, all that kind of stuff, piece by piece. Um, and I just started taking over more and more of the operations of the business bit by bit. 
Um, and over the years, I, I, I stuck my hand up and said, yeah, I'll do ad sales. Yeah, I'll do customer support um, or work with, with Hillary our, our, and, and, and manage Hillary, our, our customer support lead here at Bigger Pockets. And yeah, I'll take on this area and that area and that area and that area. And eventually, um, when Josh needed to step away in 2017, um, he named me president of the, the company. Um, and from there, we led a, uh, a process to bring on new investors um, with McCarthy Capital uh, in 2018. And from there, I assumed the, the CEO role. Um, and so I've been fortunate enough to be allowed to stay and continue leading this business um, for the last couple of years. And um, here we are. Yeah, great work, man. I, I love hearing that. Um, one interesting thing too, I know you talked about, you know, hey, you wanted to go that financially free route. That's definitely something that our audience, you know, uh, listen to this, part, is thinking about, you know, can, can relate to. Um, and they're very familiar with your guys' content, but um, your own personal journey to, you know, achieve financial freedom, which I know you talk about in your, in your book and other content, but can you maybe touch on that a little bit here on the lessons you learned through that journey and um, any advice you have for our audience kind of beginning that journey as well? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> um, I, 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 like the goal was to become financially free um, in, in there. And in 2014, so I joined Bigger Pockets in July of 2014. By November, I was under contract or I just closed on my first duplex house hack um, with that. So I had 20,000 bucks. I put down 12,000, bought the place for 240,000 and was able to really diminish um, or com even completely offset housing expenses in general with that purchase. Um, and then <clears throat> my personal finance story and my career at Bigger Pockets are intertwined, of course, um, with that, where I bought a couple of more properties, um, have a business partner on many of those properties or <clears throat> here in Denver, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and I, I purchased, I've purchased now four properties with 10 units. I continue to invest all of my surplus dollars that I saved in index funds, in addition to that, which I invested in real estate. Um, picked up a couple of syndication opportunities and slowly scaled my income um, at bigger pockets as the years kind of unwound, um, mostly through a sales role there. And then, of course, um, as president and CEO, I've got some increases in salary and those types of things. So, my position today is based on is kind of that snowball, one piece by one piece after another, mm -hmm. accumulating over seven or eight years. Um, and I own, again, those 10 units in real estate. I have a, a, a sizable stock portfolio, which would get me to, to lean fi, um, lean financial independence, uh, mo like modest financial independence on its own. And then I also um, an investor, am, am an investor in bigger pockets. Yeah. I mean, I think it sounds like just from your personal journey and how you approach real estate as well, that you're uh, extremely skilled at coming in and learning a new spot and just learning quickly and diving into ad sales or you know, operations or whatever it might be. Um, do you have any advice there on people? Cause I mean, I know there's plenty of people in our community here where they've got their day job, you know, real estate is a side gig, you know, they're trying to learn as much as they can and really dig into the real estate world. You know, do you, do you have a, a process or anything that you do when you're first learning a new skill like that, that, um, really works for you that you think could be good advice for other people to, to, you know, dive head first into something like real estate investing? Yeah, I, I think it's self-education, right? So, um, I, 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 read a lot. I actually mostly listen nowadays um, to, to audio content with that, um, often audible. I, I read at one and a half, two times speed or listen, listen at one and a half, two times speed with that. And the information is, is generally broadly over the course of my career has been based on what I'm trying to do at that moment in time. I'm not reading to collect random facts and figures. You know, it happens sometimes with that, you know, just, just for interest with that kind of stuff, but I'm constantly absorbing like, okay, here's how to run a business. Here's how to, or here's how to do growth hacking, which is part of my, here's how to do sales. Here's how to, here's how to run a technology organization. Here's, here's what good finance leadership looks like. Here's, here's how to do marketing with that, you know? So, so I, I, you can't accumulate years of experience without spending the years on that. But right. like, I think, I think you can say somebody who's got 10 years of experience in a field, you know, I can't compete with their 10 years of experience, but if I have 20 books on that subject under my belt, I can give them a run for their money in terms of, of, of producing objective results on that in a way that I, that, that, that is something I can do about it. I can absorb the perspectives of 20 thought leaders on that, um, pick the pieces I, I think are most likely to be effective in my context and begin to apply them. So 
that's, I think, the, the right approach. And I think the other approach is not being fearful of it. Um, a lot of professionals will tell you that their world and that what they do is this voodoo mystical uh, thing that only the experts can attain. And like, I've just completely been like, uh, uh-uh, no way. Like I will, I will, I know what good looks like, or I will be able to figure out what good looks like if I apply myself and there is no mysticism here. There is a practical, logical way to approach essentially every part of business in life. With that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely a big believer in reading what's timely, what's in front of you and, and, you know, learning from people who've done it before you and not trying to reinvent the wheel. So, um, lo- love that advice. Uh, you know, to get kind of tactical for this coming year, I know um, this will probably go live, you know, uh, get, getting ready to gear up for 2022 um, and talking about absorbing information. You guys put out a ton of great stuff on like you have a, a you know, a popular webinar around how to buy your first or next rental property uh, in the next 90 days. And I know kind of that 90 day, day that sprint period can really change your life and change your habits it's for the better if you if you do that correctly. Um, can you give people advice there on setting themselves up for success in 2022 and really commit to becoming a real estate investor and to taking action like that? Absolutely. So I, I think when, when I, what I, what I love about, I'll, I'll get to why I love the 90 day process in a second here, but when let's think about if you're making your first investment in real estate, right? Most likely, this is not everybody, but if I'm if I'm if I'm painting the picture of the the person who's going through this, right? This is somebody who maybe has a home already, uh, maybe has a good job, uh, probably has some money in a four hundred one k, and is investing in a couple of different areas, and is using real estate as one of the that next lever with that. In order to invest in real estate, depending on whether what you do, like for me, it was a house hack, right? But let's in fact, let's use my example, right? I, I had saved up 20 grand. That was my lifetime savings <laughs> that I'm putting into this property. I'm, I'm earning $50,000 a year and I'm taking out a mortgage for $240,000. So I'm levered like four or five to one against my annual income on it. It's the biggest bet of my life by far, right? And I'm not making that decision in a 90 day period, right? No, I spent a year, literally a year, consuming 500 to 1,000 hours of content via books, networking, podcasts, YouTube, forum interactions, all that kind of stuff just across that. I, and at a certain point after, that's the price I think that people need to pay to get into real estate is time and again, we hear successful first-time investors spent, pay that price of hundreds of hours of self-study and learning from different perspectives. Who, who's making money in condos? Who's making money in, the, in, in you know, um, uh, a low income area or a low, low cost living area? Who's making money in a high cost living area? You know, who, who's doing short-term rentals versus long-term rentals? Who's doing rent by the room instead of uh, traditional rentals with that? How does that vary in my town, which doesn't allow short-term rentals, but the next town over does? You know, like those, that, those pieces of information, after a while, you begin to pick up the nuts and bolts of real estate investing and get more and more confident that you at least can begin to solve the 80, 20 of the major problems that might impact you. Mm-hmm. Once you feel confident in that, then there's a time to say, okay, now I'm going to make a time bound decision. I'm not going to rush into the first deal I find, but like, if I can't find a property in the next 90 days, maybe I'm never going to get started with that. So that's why I love the 90 day program. But before you get into that 90 day program, I think there's a price to pay of immersing yourself in this world of real estate edu- uh, edu- self-education and getting to, to getting comfortable with all that kind of stuff um, before you, you know, dive in and make what is probably the biggest financial decision of your life, maybe besides your first home purchase or your college degree. Right. Well, do, uh, when you're going through that process, um, cause I definitely, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, you're preaching to the choir there. I think with much of our audience going through that process now, trying to educate themselves there, you know, we, we try to put out a ton of content on our YouTube, obviously bigger pockets as a, uh, you know, a community to network with and support for, for that, to learn from each other and, to, you know, listen to your podcast, your books, all of that. Um, what are, is there a test or anything that you can be asking yourself to get to that point to say like, yeah, now I'm ready to make that jump. Like now I have the confidence. Now I have the knowledge. How, how can you kind of self-assess that where you feel like, Hey, now I can make a, a, a more confident decision. Yeah. I, I think it's a qualitative assessment, right? It's, it's when am I, when am I comfortable with that? And I think it has to, it, here's another paradigm. It has to do with your income level or your, the wealth, the value of your time, right? For me, when I'm getting started, uh, I, I'm making $50,000 a year. My time is worth $25 an hour. So a thousand hours of education is twenty-five thousand dollars in an opportunity cost for me, right? If I was making five hundred thousand dollars a year, that'd be a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment, which is not appropriate, 
right? So th there's there's a component of that I think that um, that that is that is that is part of that, right? If if your time is if, if you're making less money, you can afford to invest more time in that. That said, I think that there's it's probably a hundred hours uh, with this is probably like a good floor. If you haven't done that, you probably don't even know what you don't know, and you're in and you're in kind of that danger zone. Um, with it, but I think a more, you know, one way to potentially qualitatively assess is if you can say something that sounds like this um, about your approach, you're probably getting into a good spot. I, Scott Trench, am looking to invest in real estate in Denver, Colorado. Why Denver, Colorado? Because I believe it has very good long-term prospects. I believe that the market is, people are moving here because they want to be here. Um, there's good jobs and companies that are moving in here. There's a limitation on supply. And, and, you know, there's plenty of land near Denver, but there's not a lot of water rights, um, which will which will constrict supply of new housing developments. We also have our government policies are also not favorable to lots of new development with that. So that's constriction on supply, and we've got good long-term demand prospects. So I think appreciation is going to be strong long-term. Inside of that, I've identified numerous neighborhoods near Metro Denver that I think are likely to be particularly strong uh, in appreciation over the next 10, 20, 30 years for a variety of reasons. They're in the path of progress. There's developed planned city developments going on there, yada, yada. On some edges within those neighborhoods, I'm looking for a certain amount of cash flow yield. On this edge of that neighborhood, I'm willing to take a little less cash flow. On this edge, because I think it's even more directly in the line of progress, I, or I'm sorry, because it's a little bit out of that line of progress, I need more cash flow to justify the investment. Great. My price range is 500,000 to a million dollars for duplex, triplex, quadplex. I'm looking for that kind of $200,000 per unit price point with that. Great. Um, with that, I'm looking for 1950s build because all my, my other properties are generally around that. And I'm comfortable dealing with those types of uh, those types of situations. I know the type of tenant profile that I'm going to get there, and I like two bed, one bath, or three bed, two bath properties because those give me the best prospects for long for 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 long term tenants. With that, um, I think through ups and downs, right? Okay, that's super clear, right? Now I know what I'm going to do, right? I just bought my last one. I'm going to wait about six to eight months to buy my next one. Um, that's that's an approach that I think. Um, you can say, maybe I'll lose. Maybe I won't make money with that approach. Maybe I'll make a lot of money, but I've got an approach. I feel comfortable with it. Each point of my philosophy, um, I feel comfortable with and have debated with other people and myself uh, multiple times. So if you can, you don't have to get to that level of clarity, but the closer you can get to that, if you can get reasonably close, you're probably at a position where it's time to actually commit to making that action and buying that first property. Love that. And, and then when you get to that point and you're ready to take that action, can you maybe walk through uh, some of the KPIs that you should be thinking about, uh, you know, through that process? I know that's something we're talking about now a, a ton as well going into 2022 is goal setting and all of that. So uh, maybe talk through the goal setting process and KPIs for, for newbies a little bit. Well, when I think about, you know, I, I actually don't know if I would apply KPIs specifically to this, right? You, you have to know like, hey, what's my price point? What kind of cash on cash return am I looking to get here? What do I, what am I assuming for appreciation? What's the rehab cost going to be? I need to get comfortable with my estimates on that. That's kind of a binary. Um, there's a, it's a, it's, it's black, white, and gray, right? Like I either feel really confident in that. I'm not sure about a couple of the numbers or I'm not confident at all. You have to move it as far as you can along that spectrum to feel confident with that analysis of that. But I, I think, I, I don't know how to answer your question in terms of KPIs, but I can say that a reasonable place to start if you're thinking about making that commitment is to go back and sit down with your agent or go on Zillow or Redfin or um, whatever you need and start looking at the properties that have sold in the last 90 days, 90 or 180 days. Um, I usually say 180, but this year it's bad. I've had to go to 90 because the market changes so quickly with this. Um, okay. So in the last 90 days, let's say that there's been five properties that have sold that meet your qualifications that are in your price range with that, and that meet, meet this criteria you've scoped out. You know, at that point that a property on average is going to sell that meets your criteria every two and a half weeks. So that's a pro appropriate goal. You know that you probably have a good shot at buying a property that's going to meet your criteria in the next 90 days because you're going to have five chances on average with that. That's, a, that's probably, and, and you know that that's a good deal because you've narrowed it down until you found the five best deals that have actually transacted in a recent past in your market with that. So that, that's a potential place to start, I think. Um, and, if, and if you see no properties that have transacted that would meet any of your criteria, 
you know you're living in fantasy land and need to reset your, your search parameters or try something new with that um, because you're gonna have one crack a year maybe at it. And that's just not, that's just too low probability to get started with that. If your strategy is dependent on you getting the one deal a year that makes that makes sense, um, you're gonna be you're gonna be waiting a long time. It's just not a good strategy. Yeah, I is love that. that. Is that like, helpful? Yeah, super that extremely helpful. Yeah. And I mean, I think you uh, being able to come in and lay out that specificity for people and saying, hey, here's here's how to think about this, you know, in overall, you know, bigger picture uh, is gonna give people the confidence to say, yeah, now I'm now I'm at that point where I can actually, you know, attend the webinar, get, you know, get, get more specific on taking action. Um, you mentioned there too the 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 market you know shifting often. Um, that is one thing I, I you know we like to bring on experts here that you know have a pulse on the market. And I mean, you guys being the largest online community of real estate investors, you know, clearly uh, you know have that as well. Um, can you maybe talk about your thoughts on you know the the, the current state of the market, um, and if you have any advice for people on how you know how to be changing their behavior, if at all based on, you know, uh, where things are right now? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think this is the scary part about 2021, right. Is, and like, let's, let's say, let's ignore real estate for a second. Where do you go for yield in general in 2021? Do you go to crypto? Do you go, do you sit, do you sit in cash, right? Inflation's looming on, you know, crypto is very volatile, volatile, right. And, you know, there's like, there's a lot of people that feel really confident in it. And a lot of people who are very skeptical of it, right. Um, do you sit in cash? Um, you know, if inflation looms, that's going to lose its purchasing power and, and going to be a huge loser for you with that. Um, do, you, do you put it into the stock market? That's at all time highs relative to price to earnings with that. Do you put it in gold? Do you put it in, do you put it in bonds with yields at all time lows? Um, do you put it in real estate with that, right? So I think, I think that that's, that's the question that I think a lot of investors, you put it in commodities uh, with this, you know, um, uh, what, what do you do in 2021? And so I think that in the context of that environment, a lot of people, including myself are like, well, yeah, housing prices just rose 20% year over year. That's insane. Um, how long can that last? Yet, interest rates are low and the Fed is signaling they're going to remain pretty low with very gradual tapering over the next couple of years with this. Um, wages are rising very quickly. Yields, bond yields are at all time low. That means that the, if, if, if you're borrowing money and investing that in an in inflation resistant asset, um, that's how you beat, in, 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 that's how you win in an inflationary environment with that. Um, so, so I think that like, for me, um, you don't, you don't know, right. And then, and then you go into like, okay, then you go into real estate and you say, okay, what are the factors for supply and demand? We just talked about one big lever in prices for real estate, which is interest rates. If interest rates rise, that's going to cause prices to come down because people can't afford um, to pay as much for that. Um, because the payment matters more than the price for most people who are buying real estate, including homeowners and landlords with that. Then, then you have to say, okay, on the supply side, what's happening? Well, there's a big shortage of construction labor. Materials costs are expensive. Local governments in many areas are not helping to expand, to, to allow lots of new development. And there are either there are land and water shortages in, in many parts of the country with that. The West has plenty of land, no water, and the East has plenty of water, no land, right? Um, with that. So, so that's, that's some constrictions on supply. Then you have to go to demand, right? What are, what are people doing there? Demand, I think, the 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 sick the, the population continues to grow with that, but I think there are there could be some question marks about how that's going to look over the next five to ten years as millennials settle down. If prices continue to increase, are people going to move in together? Is rent by the room going to get more popular? Is short term rentals going to create uh, more? true occupancy of properties across this country as people rent out their homes and they're not using them. I don't know. So, so that, that could be one question, but I think that the biggest risk is really interest rates. So if interest rates rise quickly, that begins to, to hurt equity values um, on that. But the, 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 uh, the, the silver lining, I think on that is that for, for landlords is that rents are inflation is probably going to be rising at the same time that interest rates are rising and therefore rents will continue to increase with that. So I don't know, after all that, here I am, I'm the CEO of bigger pockets, like sure, you know, you can, you can know your source with that kind of stuff, but like, I like real estate as an asset class in that context. It can definitely, there could definitely be something I'm missing um, here that, that, that causes a sharp decline or, or causes that you know, that some of this changes one of those factors, but for me, I'm continuing to put money into real estate, um, uh, on a, on a personal level. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, 
you know, and I love how you walked us through just the bigger financial picture of say hey, investing period, you got to be thinking bigger than just, you know, the real estate niche. But once you've made that commitment, that decision, you're ready to take action, you're, you're kind of, you know, putting together your plan. Um, I know bigger pockets in general, like you guys have a lot of really powerful, you know, interactive uh, calculators and reports and things like that. Can you maybe give our audience an overview of your property analysis process? Um, I know it's a big question, but um, being able to, to talk through the foundations of what makes a good deal and, and how to analyze a deal like that, um, I think people would find really valuable as well. Yeah, sure. So, so I'll, I'll walk you through my personal process and with, with that, if that's that works. So, so like I mentioned, you know, I start, I start with the market, right. And I'm, and I say in 30 years, am I going to be wealthy if I buy a, a large amount of real estate in Denver, Colorado and hold on to it and maintain it well? And to me, the answer is no overwhelming. Yes. I think, I think you're going to see four or 5% annualized depreciation over the next 30 years in Denver, Colorado with that. Right. So that's a really freeing thing to say. Right now, I know like I don't have to care if I'm buying at the top, middle, or bottom of the market. I'm just going to buy consistently and hold, and I'm going to let the long term uh, uh, that long term magic do its work. Then I'm going to capitalize consistently uh, or capitalize conservatively uh, in the context that I'm going to have a, a good cash reserve. I'm going to make sure that my my cash flow from my properties or my portfolio in aggregate is more than enough to offset the the cost of the mortgage in any reasonable environment that I can I can I can conceive of or predict with that right and I'm going to have a strong personal financial position outside of real estate just in case uh, I need to commit more capital there with that because if you go you know that long term five percent return or five percent appreciation rate um, that gets wiped out if you go bankrupt um, and that would be very embarrassing to go bankrupt um, if you've written a book called Set for Life so that's a uh, that's always a, a something in my head there okay. From there, I go through exactly what I just described earlier. I look at what has sold in the last 90 to 180 days, and I keep up to date on that in a rolling basis as I'm going through that process. Um, I analyze those previously sold properties, and then I analyze um, using our calculators um, the, the properties that I am actually going to go and tour and look at with that. But again, I kind of know um, going into those properties because it's like, oh, here's here's a quadplex that I've analyzed previously that sold for, you know, five hundred fifty thousand dollars in this part of town. Great. Well, the next one that's very similar looking with all those types of things, I know that's going to be a winner most likely. Um, the moment it hits the market with that, so I can drop what I'm doing, go to the property, look at it, take in any context, make sure that I add in. Okay, there's a big crack right there. I might have to spend forty fifty k fixing that thing, or Looks good, but I'm going to need to update the kitchen. I'm going to need to remodel this. I'm going to have to overdo the little landscaping and all that. So then I'm able to get a reasonably a reasonable picture of what I think the rehab is going to be on that property from a, a high level analysis piece to put that into the calculator and understand the returns that I'm going to get on that property before and after the remodel. So does that answer yeah. your question there? Yeah, that's great. I mean, going through that process, are there any specific spots that you think? are you know, easy pitfalls or areas that you think, uh, you know, rookies might be uh, you know, consistently getting wrong or an easy, easy place to get tripped up? I think it's zooming out and, and looking at the big picture with that, right? I think, I think that, you know, and, and this is what I think is great about bigger pockets is, is I'm a little removed from being that rookie, right? I'm, I'm seven, six, seven years, but on the rookie real estate rookie podcast, you can hear exactly what that, that, the, those problems that folks are going through. But if, if I were to guess, I would think it's, I think it's around that rehab process, right? Because you've only got a certain amount of cash when you're buying your first deal and anything over that that needs to go into the rehab is pretty terrifying, I think, for, 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 uh, to a large degree. And so I think having somebody that can, you know, your agent or an investor friend or somebody you trust that is hard-nosed, that, that knows that, that market and, and what, what rehabs look like in there to help you walk through that and say, that's a big deal. You're going to need to set aside cash for that. That one you can leave for a couple of years um, with it. That's no big, that's not, that's nothing there. You can, you don't have to worry about that. Having somebody that can help you through that, I think will get you over a big part of the hump. And then the second piece is, you know, again, if you zoom out on a 30 year time horizon, like I, I bought my first duplex for $240,000. It's worth 450 to $550,000 right now. Like, do I care if I bought that property for two hundred and forty-five thousand dollars versus two hundred and forty? Right. right. How, how, what kind of impact does that have over a ten-year hold on average with that? 
right? Yet that is so incredibly important to me or was so incredibly important to me at the time I was making that first purchase with that, right? And yet it's, it's, uh, it's, it's completely meaningless in the context of my overall return profile for that, that property. So I think that's, th those are probably two areas is thinking like, okay, you know, if I'm flipping the property, then that $5,000 comes directly out of my profit with that. But I'm going to hold it for 20, 30 years. If I think the market's going to appreciate, like, what do I care? If, if you know, I, I don't want to overpay. I don't want to get a bad deal, but I, I, can, I can buy the right pieces of real estate and hold on. And I may make a lot more money doing that than losing deals that are in that, that perfect location over a couple of grand. Right. You're making a bigger bet than that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, and I know you mentioned like, obviously it's been a little while since you were, a, you know, a rookie, you know, within the real estate investing world, definitely have people listening to this as well that are, you know, scaling their, you know, uh, acquiring, you know, a more, you know, a higher volume of properties. They're, they're really looking at building out a team. And I know that's something that I've been extremely impressed by uh, with your organization is just the, the talent that you guys attract and the team that you've been able to build. Um, you know, I, forward facing like like Brandon, David, Mindy, all you know, everybody that's that's on the content side, all the way through to, you know, anybody I've talked to, you know, on your marketing team, all of that been been very impressed there. Um, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs, for you know, real estate investors building a team on how to attract talent like that, how to build a team, um, and the lessons that you've learned uh, you know, over the years doing that? Mm. Look, the hard the hardest part of, of being, um, CEO, I think is knowing what good looks like in each one of your executive or leadership team positions with that, right? You, you do it yourself. So you have an idea to a certain extent, or you get by somehow to get to the, if you're going to get in the, in the position where you're going to be hiring a, an executive leader or somebody on your senior team, that's going to, it's going to be key to your business. Somehow, some way you've been completing that function or getting around that function to that point, but it's hard to know what good looks like. Um, in there, and then to parse out what good looks like from your mentor who did ran a completely different business, and what good looks like in the context of your business. And I don't know of an approach that like, like, I, I, like I said, I read a lot of books. I did what I could to short circuit the experience piece. I read a lot of books. I tapped as many people as I could from a network perspective. I did that, and I still made a number of big mistakes um, in, in in that context. But I think it's, I think it's, you have to give it a shot. You have to know what good looks like and you have to know what bad looks like and make sure that it doesn't last and, and doesn't stick around with that. And that you're able to say, no, 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 this is good. And you have 90 days to fix it. No, 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 no. And, and I'm not going to hear it. This is good. And I'm going to hear it. In, I'm going to see it in 60 days. I'm going to have it in 30 days. Oh, I'm not seeing that. Here's a nice severance package. Right. And so I think that's, that's the hardest part. And it feels like as a leader, you need to be able to say, I'm here to stick up for my entire team and I'm going to make them be successful with all that kind of stuff. And sometimes that says, no, I have to be able to recognize what good and bad looks like, make sure I'm attracting the good and I'm gracefully um, exiting the bad with that. And once that happens um, with that, you, you begin to attract a ton more of that good in there. The, the magic that is that that's happened af, as we've built this team and attracted great talent and made some hard decisions uh, with that. Um, once once that's over, uh, it's just it just blossoms for us, and we're seeing all of these incredible outputs. It's like every week now, our leadership team is coming together, and huge strategic problems solved over here while operating results are, are, are increasing with that. Oh, we, there's this issue that doesn't really sit neatly between part, departments. Oh, there's no there's no um, who owns that or whatever. No, it's a collaborative like. Uh, I've got it. No, I've got it. No, we'll jointly tackle it together in the next couple of weeks with that. Um, and so that's, I think, the magic that happens um, when you begin to get it right. But what do I know? You know, I've, I've gone through ups and downs with, with a couple of these things, and I've seen when it's not working, and I've seen when it, and it right now, uh, you're catching me at a, at a point in time when I think it's, it's working really well for us. Yeah. I mean, it's inspiring to hear. So I, I really appreciate you, you laying out your thought process and any of the challenges that you're facing there. And uh, th this has been fantastic, Scott. I really, really appreciate your time. I, I, I do think uh, one, one last question I did have, and I just thought it was very interesting, you know, uh, digging in a little bit. I know you guys just had BP con, you know, a, a little while ago um, at that, you talked about using podcasts to build your business, um, you know, podcasts like this one. Uh, and I know you're just prolific uh, content creator yourself, you know, between that and writing and all that. Um, curious, do you recommend that real estate investors focus on 
you know, content as part of their marketing strategy? Or um, I'm just curious on uh, if you have a playbook for our audience on, you know, in, you know, content in general, and then if not that, you know, how should they be thinking about their marketing strategy more broadly? Yeah. By the way, I want to say, I want to say tip a big caveat here, bad, right? I'm using good and bad with that right for our business, wrong for our business. Some of, some of the folks that, that, um, are, are thriving here may not have thrived in previous roles because it wasn't the right one for them. And some of the folks that maybe didn't thrive here are probably going to go out and thrive in incredible ways that in other environments with that. So I just want to put a caveat there. We've not had any bad with that. We've had wrong for us, I would say it, it is, is more appropriate with that. Um, to answer your question about content, um, Yes, content can, of course, you know, so you're saying, what is the cost? What, 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 how is content going to be an acquisition source for some sort of value for my business, whether it's deals, um, talents, partners, money, what, I don't know, whatever that is, thought, just general reputation building. Okay, great. So there's, there's some sort of value to it and there's some sort of cost to it, right? Bigger pockets, that's really literal and easy for us um, in a way that's probably not for, for, for downstream for, for the type of question you're asking with that for most companies, right? We produce a podcast and we make advertising revenue and that advertising revenue more than offsets the cost that we pay to our hosts to produce the episode for the overhead, for the, the leadership team to, to manage that and the producers and all that kind of good stuff, right? So when we produce content, we make money because that's a media, we, we literally call that our media business, right? And CNN or Fox News, whatever floats your boat, um, whatever they post content, they're making money on that content because the advertising revenue offsets the cost to produce. So that's really easy. If you're talking about another business that is not getting enough viewership on that or monetizing through something that is direct, there needs to be a downstream benefit. So you have to say, okay, I'm going to post a blog post and that's going to give me X amount of leads if it's a news piece um, right away. Or I'm gonna, it's gonna produce X amount of SEO traffic over the next five to ten, you know, next three to five years. Let's call it before it gets out of date, unless I'm updating it constantly. And then, you know, that great. What's the cost and what's the expected return um, with that? And then I think you have to say, if I do one, you know, if you, if I do one mailer to one property, you know, I'm probably not gonna get a call back uh, from that from that owner and buy that and buy that house. If I do one blog post, I'm not gonna do it. So I have to say, okay, I have to think in terms of if I do a hundred posts, right? How many of them, you know, 85 of them are going to get no traffic um, or be really niche content with that. 10 are going to be so-so and five are going to be winners with that. Great. Now, now I've built out my, my formula and I know, okay, that's, that's what it's going to take to, is that worth it? Am I going to get enough leads from that, that set of a hundred to make it worthwhile? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, and I, I really appreciate the the bigger picture perspective that you that you bring to each of these questions. So I uh, again, thank you so much for your time today, Scott. I know uh, you know and you've got a busy schedule, so I appreciate you coming out and uh, you know being able to educate our audience on on you know all these things. So awesome. Well, yeah. well, thank you. I really appreciate it, Matt, and and had a great time. Yeah, and what is the best way to get for people to get uh, in touch with you? Obviously, you guys have everything you're you're doing over the bigger pocket side, but um, you know, if people want to want to follow you personally as well, what's the best way to to get in touch? Yeah, sure. I'm on Bigger Pockets at biggerpockets.com. You can just search my name in the search bar or search biggerpockets.com, Scott Trench. Um, and then the uh, the uh, my Instagram is at Scott underscore Trench. Perfect. Great. Those are probably cool. the two best ways. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Matt. All right, and everyone watching, uh, this is Matt Camp with Deal Machine and happy deal finding.